One thing that kind of became clear as I was going through this research is that many times when we're talking about authoritarian patterns in the global south, they are connected to the destruction of nature, we tend to borrow uh, the framework of analysis from what's happening uh, in other places, primarily in the global north. And something that became quite clear is that when Bolsonaro took power in Brazil, and one of his first actions was, for example, to put a terrible minister of the environment in place, Ricardo Salles, who was uh, actually convicted of fraud in relation to environmental policy and to cut the, um, the resources for climate change adaptation and mitigation research in the Ministry of the Environment and many other things like being very supported by agribusiness, a lot of people were just comparing that to Trump and the climate change di denialism coming from Trump. But this is sort of a simplistic uh, word view because of the way that these denialisms work in the North and in the South, they vary according to the economic arrangements and the level of dependence in a place. So what I'm going to mention right now, trying to fit this within 10 minutes, is that yes, we need to bring in uh, a perspective around capitalist dependence when we're talking about how authoritarianism destroys nature in the global south because extractivism really is one of the main frames here. And this becomes even clearer nowadays when we're talking about the new patterns of extractivism. They are connected to green capitalism and false solutions around climate change and what is the demand that you have in the center of capitalism and the places at the margins they're supposed to just supply for that demand, uh, turning entire areas in the global south into sacrifice zones. So something that we have is that, yes, capitalist dependence is connected to extractivism. We know that there are leftists. Uh, what's happening here with the microphone? There are leftists. Can you hear me? OK. I can't hear myself very well right now. Uh, so there are leftist authoritarian practices that are connected to extractivism. So we've seen that with like mega development projects in Latin America. We've seen that under governments they are labeled as moderate left or progressive. And this is something to contend with. Uh, and it comes with a lot of contradictions because it's usually justified through social policy. So it's in the name of development. We can do all of these things, but we also have social policy. Or for example, we will advance a lot of our um, extractivist positions around oil, but then we can use those royalties for healthcare or for education. It's just fighting those means. But then when there's a lot of hunger for extractivism, for getting at fossil fuels or other types of minerals, and nowadays for green minerals as well, this can be justified in another way when we're talking about far right regimes or far right governments, because then you don't actually need to go about handling the contradiction. You don't have to go about bringing social policy to compensate for things, because you can come from a white supremacist point of view, uh, really devaluing the worth of indigenous and traditional communities, promoting violence against them, uh, ensuring that no rights will, will be part of the program, uh, or that, for example, these populations they are taking care of the forest, maybe they should just be assimilated within urban areas and become part of you know, what it actually means to be Brazilian. So this uh, is part of the fascist values of a nation that have been employed from the perspective of looking at the environment in the Bolsonaro government. And because of this, we have referred to this, well, wow, this is a denialist government because it's promoting, yes, climate change denialism is part of it because it's not really investing in it. It's making people doubt uh, what's happening. And these parallels could be seen around Trump as well. But what we all also saw in the past years is that this one type of denialism, there's something that we can connect uh, to the discussion around fossil fascism. And this is something that Andres Maum and the Zetkin Collective have done quite well in explaining in the book, um, white skin, black fuel, is that you do have fo fossil fascism, you do have fossil capital involved in all of this, but there's interest also in opening up the markets for these other things that are happening, like carbon markets. So every business in Latin America doesn't want to be outside of this. Because on one hand, yes, it's very interesting to go and promote deforestation so you can do more and more land grabbing, so you can turn more and more things into monocultures, but if you can also be compensated 
if you keep like a tiny little amount of forest within your land, well, that's also interesting to us. So this is something that we saw in Brazil when there was a shift in the Ministry of the Environment that a lot of people actually saw, well, wow, this really terrible denialist guy came in and others like more pragmatic approach uh, with the new minister, with uh, Joaquin Leite. And Joaquin Leite has this motto talking about, well, this is like environmentalism with results, ambientalismo de resultado. But the fact that what we have actually is that Leite was in the ministry from before under the, the, the previous minister. He was put there by agribusiness directly because he had been involved with one of the main societies for uh, agribusiness for over two decades. And he was there already with a project called Floresta Mais, which is like Forest Plus, that's connected to making sure that you can promote new ways of commodification around forests and uh, uh, promote compensation schemes. This means that last year during COP26 in Glasgow, Brazil went from not really presenting itself at all during the COPs and the climate change negotiations to trying to promote itself as the future of the green economy. So when we get into right-wing anti-ecologies, we end up with three types of denialisms. One type of this denialism is connected to green capitalism, this idea around false solutions. So yes, there is climate change, yes, there is a, a, an ecological crisis, but you uh, deflect people from the root cause of what's happening here, capitalism, colonialism, uh, different types of racism, and so you deflect people from that, and you also provide a false solution that you can build a market on top of this. You find this with um, leftist anti-ecologists as well, because it's a way of mediating with liberal democracy and green capitalism in general. But you also have these other two types, which is like the standard scientific nihilism that's connected to fossil capital, fossil fascism. In the left, you will find it at the margins, sometimes justified as being anti-imperialism. So we find this in Latin America in uh, some of the more developmentalist approaches or thinking that, well, we need to exploit all, all of our resources because we, if we don't, the imperialists will come and they'll take it. So climate change is a ruse to you know, help the imperialists. Uh, we, we have to protect our things and then we can't develop. But this is very much at the margins. When we look into terms of like of the of the governments, there's more of a, of a mediation and now this tendency towards green capitalism. But with the right wing anti ecologists, you have the green capitalist deni uh, denialism, the standard one. But there's also a tendency now that we find in towers like eco fascist denialism, that's coupled with eco apartheid. So one of the things that I have been interested in looking into is that when you look at the global north and the majority of the literature, the research done so far around eco-fascism is focused in the global north. So United States, um, uh, separatist movements around bioregionalism in the United States, appropriation of indigenous values. So you may remember, for example, when they stormed into the capital, uh, there was like this guy, like the QAnon shaman, and he was like taking on the like the very, very strong appropriation of uh, indigenous values. You find this in Europe, uh, very much connected to closing borders, being anti-migrant, anti and the immigrants, they're coming and they're taking our resources and they're like dirtying things up and we need to protect our national parks and we can do this with, you know, our white European values. So this is very strong. Um, and it's already part of how you even organize cities and how policies are being promoted. And it's, it's also kind of shaking things up when you look into these fascist, like far right movements um, in Europe, because you will have some there are saying, well, we're standing with the coal miners here because we're going to defend their jobs. Uh, and the other ones say, no, climate change is a real thing. So in the name of climate change, like what Mint was talking about, we need to protect ourselves from those and they can like take care of their things over there. But what's really interesting here is that this is always coming under the assumption that, well, we will protect ourselves, we will close our borders, but they will be closed only in one direction because when it comes to coming for your resources, we'll still keep doing that. And there's a framework that we discuss within uh, Marxist, Marxist ecology around ecological imperialism. 
that can be applied both when we're talking about like standard resources, like so, like like fossil capital, talking about um, fossil fuels in general, and monocrops. You know, the influx of soy from you know Latin America and to feed animals that are going to um, to the diets of people in the north and things like that. But also what we're calling you know uh, green extractivism nowadays. Um, that I believe Marcus is going to deal a little bit uh, with that because it's about protecting this imperial mode of living um, that's been promoted for a really long time. But what's interesting here is that this doesn't mean that in the South we are protected against this version of eco-fascism. Um, it's not something that we might see right away in terms of the regimes because the pattern of extractivism and how central it is to the economies of these capitalist um, dependent economies in the global south, it kind of gets, gets in the way because you have to destroy nature to keep up with the demands of the national elites. They are very much inclined to collaborate with the international elites, but the level of racism that's involved into this and the fact that in the global south, there's a tendency to turn almost everything into a sacrifice zone Whereas in the global north, it's more about these pockets. So you, usually where you have like indigenous communities or more racialized communities. So we could be talking, for example, around the tar sands in, in, in Canada or uh, the wet uh struggles in British Columbia in Canada where you have sacrifice zones there. While the Trudeau government with its liberal approach, so it's not going to look authoritarian from the outside, it can look like it's collaborating to fight climate change. But you have sacrifice zones there. You have sacrifice zones in Australia because, well, it's a settler colonial state. But it could still be considered the global north in that sense. But in Latin America or in Africa, you find that, well, the whole continent, referred to as a country, like I thought that the quote was like so emblematic of the situation, well, this can be seen as a whole sacrifice zone. And then this happens that, well, what we have here is that it's, this ends up being an obstacle for the growth of eco-fascism eco for now in these areas. But with the rise in militarism, and as the crisis heightens, there's a tendency for us to get more into pockets of trying to create these uh, enclosed spaces within society. And something that's um, already arising, for example, there's some discourses around eco-fascism now, for example, in El Salvador, there's some discourses around eco-fascism in the sense that, well, they're not really taking care of nature. We are going to start taking care of it. And that, that ends up being an excuse to actually further um, extractivism around certain minerals. So uh, what Mint was describing uh, in relation to Burma, we're also seeing that in a few parts here and there, but it's still very embryonary, doesn't have the right, like quite the potential to become what the far right is going to be explo is exploiting in Latin America so far. But this is something that we have to be quite aware of because um, when we're talking about eco-fascism, we also have to be talking about eco-apartheid. So we, if we already have societies in the global south, they're very inclined toward segregation. They're very inclined towards a racial separation of our communities being rural or urban. That creates fertile ground, perhaps not as fertile as it already is in places where you understand this around particular borders, state borders. But it can be fertile when you expand the notion of borders in terms of like gated communities, in terms of the separation, like uh, more like luxurious neighborhoods and the favelas. And this is something that we have to be quite aware of when we're also talking about when there's a new influx of money towards mitigation and adaptation and where you're actually applying those resources for adaptation uh, schemes in the cities and in rural areas in the global south because there's a tendency of thinking of like adaptation in a way that will also be organized around environmental racism and a very unequal um, distribution of resources in, in these areas in the global south. So we, uh, what we have actually is that the global north is still kind of setting this agenda. So. Uh, there's a fear that, well, if fascism is rising in one place, it's going to rise somewhere else. Eco-fascism still has a lot of potential to become a global, a global phenomenon. So I'm going to end here. <laughs>